Hey everybody, welcome to the next edition of UA Coffee Talk. Uh, as in the last few episodes, we have our typical guests, Nebo and John. Welcome back, guys. And we have a new guest with us, Paul Bowen from Algolift. And Paul, maybe just really briefly, could you tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, so I uh, started in mobile, uh, in advertising 20 years ago. Uh, 10 years ago, I started the European office of TapJoy uh, over in London. Uh, late 2015, I moved to San Francisco with TapJoy. Uh, did a six months there and then moved to Unity where I oversaw the account management team on the ads, in the ads division there. So overseeing the performance uh, advertisers working with, with Nebo over at uh, MZ at that time. Uh, was there for three years and then, and then joined Algorithm six months ago. Nice. And so the topic of our discussion today is going to be all about LTV. I thought we could first start by talking, uh, maybe starting with you, Paul. So, you know, Algolib provides LTV, PLTV sorts of analysis, but could we talk about what are the primary ways that game companies use LTV today? And, and just to be clear, do they use LTV or do they use PLTV? Yeah, so I mean, the, the P in PLTV means predicted, so you're, right. you're essentially trying to understand what the future looks like uh, based on, on past, past behavior. Um, I think you guys did a really good job of, of sort of breaking down how most uh, most current game companies are understanding sort of marketing metrics right now. So um, I'd say almost all all of our sort of clients and, and people that we talk to are looking at D7 ROAS right. uh, as the core metric against which they optimize their uh, marketing campaigns. We have some clients who's, who uh, use D1 ROAS as a, as a metric to understand sort of the future lifetime uh, value of their users. But really, what, what we're trying to do, and I think where the market is going to go over the next couple of years, is looking out uh, a further window than seven days, which right. is a, a really hard problem to, to sort of solve. And you know, I think you guys talked, and, and we, we may talk more further in this session, about sort of various ways, simple ways to sort of predict that future lifetime value, but really understanding sort of what the uh, lifetime value of a user will be in a year's time, or two years' time, or three years' time, if you've got a, a max three game. It's pretty integral if you're thinking about maximizing your marketing spend. And as competition on, on the sort of marketing platforms gets more, uh, it gets tougher, you know, you want to be able to, to basically spend as much as you can. Right. And, and so for you and your clients, they, people want PLTV, the predictive LTV part, because they yeah. want to know up to how much they can spend to acquire users, right? That's right, yeah. I mean, you know, most clients uh, that we work with sort of have a, a pretty strict payback window that they want to be hitting. So Although they'll look at seven-day ROAS as a short-term metric to, to basically move money around, yeah. ultimately they'll go and do a look back over a long period of time to see whether they actually hit that payback window. So they'll do a review of their marketing spend over, say, six months, and uh, you know, D180, 100% payback window is, is a typical sort of payback window that clients, that clients will look at. Right. And for Nebo and John, you guys, in your experience, what you guys do or what, you're, you, know, what you hear your colleagues are doing, what, what are the primary applications for you guys when it comes to LTV or PLTV? Uh, pretty much the, the same thing, basically just understanding when the money is going to pay back and how well we did, how well we did with our previous campaigns and where we should spend the money in the future. And it has to happen really quickly. I think that's uh, well, one more point that's really important. It's just you cannot wait for like six months to see whether something pay back or not. Right. Ideally, you know, you should understand what's going on after like a week or maybe a few days and be able to like make decisions based on, 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 on the outputs of the predictive LTV model. What's interesting is that um, if, you, if you go back to like the, the beginnings of like uh, mobile smartphones, right? Uh, a lot of times uh, you had the first developers on scene that had the luxury to wait. Right? They didn't have a lot of competitors, they didn't have to worry about the cost of acquisition as much. Yeah. Um, nowadays it's very, very different where you have a lot of competitors, cost of acquisition is always rising. So waiting is much more cost uh, uh, relevant in terms of that decision making. So uh, moving towards PLTV is definitely something that uh, a lot of companies, uh, including companies I've worked for, have moved towards. Right, but that's a great point, John, because to your point, what you're saying is because there's so much competition, if you have a good idea of how much you can spend and be confident that you can make it back, mm -hmm. then you know because acquiring users is an auction-based market, you, you want to be able to max that up as much as possible in order to get market share, right? 
That's right. Uh, just to give you one quick example there, like I remember uh, when I joined Play Studios, our VP of UA at the time actually said that if I can go back in time three years ago, I would spend this much more on UA. Right. I wish I could throw a million dollars instead. We right. only threw a hundred thousand, and that's always that kind of hindsight that uh, marketers will always see when we're thinking right. about UA. And I think yeah. budgets went up quite a bit in the last five, six years <laughs> yeah. too. So you know, there's more kind of asking the game. It's just yeah. more risky to make yeah. bad decisions. You know. The, I remember when I was in Norway, we were spending, I think, a million dollars a month, and there was like a huge budget for that, <laughs> like in 2012. Now, like, pretty much every other developer spends a million dollars a month, or like a mid sized developer. Right, right. Um, so, the, the change as well, so it's just more risky to not make the uh, right decisions at the time. And so, for some of the developers out there, or some of the UA folks out there who are thinking about how to use PLTV, so, like, this, when we talk about Facebook or Google, PLTV to some degree doesn't matter so much is that right or do you factor that in and then do you just use that for more like the you know reward video networks and stuff like that or how are you guys you know once you get that pltv number how are you guys using that yeah i mean ltv matters on every platform so what you have so facebook and google look at these short-term sort of feedback loops so yeah. uh like a value optimization uh bit strategy or, or app event optimization so they, they give quick feedbacks to the algorithms to find the users for the marketing campaigns. Um, however, what the, the app developer cares about, what the game developer cares about, is really the long-term value of those users. So whereas Facebook and Google are, are concerned about short-term short -term metrics because right. that's what they're taught to optimize towards, really what, what game companies care about is the long-term long -term value, LTV. Uh, so LTV is, 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 is sort of foundational to sort of what, what, what you're doing. And I guess sort of one of the challenges with working with, say, Facebook or Google is they're not looking across all the channels. They're only looking at their own yeah. user acquisition channel. Yeah. So even if they did build their own LTV model, which they could do for their for, for their own products, they're not telling you what the LTV across all, all the channels is. So. Yeah, I think one of the challenges with Facebook and Google is that you cannot really input like a specific number. Let's say you know your LTV is twenty dollars after like four hundred and eighty days, and you're like you paid twenty dollars for that type of traffic. You cannot really control um, uh, the, the price that way or the cost that way, and as a result, it's just much harder to to apply learnings from uh, from like a PLTV you know models to, to Facebook and Google. I've also noticed like with differences between like ad networks and uh, Google and Facebook is that like it's significantly harder to predict that LTV on LT, uh, Google and uh, Facebook where you don't have a lot of control in terms of like. Uh, how they change their optimization model. Google specifically, you don't have a lot of control in terms of like the price and the bid uh, yeah. as much. Uh, whereas like with re uh, reward video or ad networks, I've observed that like their uh, algorithms are uh, typically rule based and they're typically much more static in terms of like how they evolve over time. So you actually have a lot more time to determine um, the, what your PLTV is. For reward a video versus like a Facebook Google where things can be changing significantly. Right. And so on that side, on Facebook Google side, from an algorithm perspective, do you guys do stuff like P ROAS or like do you have any products that can help people on, on that side? Yeah, so uh, um, should I tell you what we do and then sort of Let's do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So uh, so so we um, so there's a couple of different ways to sort of uh, predict sort of L T V and I think um, you guys covered them uh, a couple uh, last week, one of them is sort of using this uh, ARPU curve slash using a multiple on the seven row as to yeah. predict future LTV. Yep. Another might be using uh, retention and opt out uh, to sort of model out what the PLTV over a long period of time looks like. They're both good, um, but they're both cohort models and they're, they're limited in terms of how flexible they are. Uh, they don't account for sort of anomalies where you have whales inside them, uh, and you, can also, you can't also break down those. Uh, models you can't enter sort of to really understand what's going on in the cohort. Uh, so, so what we do is we approach it from the user level and we make user level uh, projections uh, on a daily basis for every uh, gate player in a game. So every every single user every day gets an updated PLTV projection uh, for day 30, 60, 90, 180, and 365. Uh, we do project out further than that, um, but there's a lot of, there's inherent risk in sort of making projections and right. making marketing decisions when you're buying on, say, a two-year window. Uh, so we tend to advise against that. 
So we, on a daily basis, will ingest data from our clients, the most recent sort of attribution and um, transaction data, so whether that's uh, IP purchases, subscriptions, or ad, ad views. We run the models, we share back the data with them, and that allows them to get an understanding of, of the health of the users within their game. So that's the first thing that we do, which is sort of user level uh, LTV projections, the benefit of user level, and, and there's some, some companies in, in the market have done this. There's a really interesting case study from Lyft. They, they have a really sophisticated uh, marketing stack. Uh, but you can sort of roll up your users on in any dimension, so any geo platform, uh, any, anything appended to sort of a user ID to yeah. really understand what your sort of L, the LTV of each cohort looks like. So that has real flexibilities and benefits in terms of sort of driving value for, for, for both UA and... Right. So you could up. use that to come up with sort of some type of ROAS model. Is that built into your platform? So yes. So then the second thing we do is we connect to the reporting and manage APIs of Facebook, Google, and Apple. Yeah. So then we'll pull in the spend data from those three platforms. So we'll yeah. pull, pull in the historical spend data and then on a daily basis we'll update the most recent days. So that allows us at the user level to understand a P row as per user. We can then roll up, because we have the spend and we have the LTV, we're right. able to sort of understand the projected ROAS over, over you know, a year, two years' time. Um, in, in order to do that, you would have needed some you know, training data or you would have needed someone to have bought there before. So like, how long generally would, would it take or how much time does it take before you get a good, whether it's a PLTV or P ROAS yep. type of... Yeah, so I, I mean, I think you guys saw a bit about this uh, uh, last week. Um, I mean, the more historical data, the better for us in terms of, uh, yeah, we need to train our models on historical yeah. data. Uh, we can use priors from similar apps for new types of games. Right. So we do, so uh, if, a, if a client launches a new game and it's a match three, we have a bunch of match threes on our platform, so we already have an understanding of what a curve might look like. And, right. As the cohort matures, obviously we can get better at, and better at predicting that. Right. Um, we tend to ingest at least a year's worth of data um, when we start working with a client. That means that we um, can see temporal changes. So, you know, uh, we see sort of you know the summer bump when everyone starts getting on their phones, and uh, especially on the on the marketing side, you know, December to December to January prices get generally right. cheaper to acquire users because brands stop spending in in January. Um, so we ingest uh, at least a year's worth of data, um, but we start making projections really on a new product after about, well, we, start, we build a model immediately and use priors to do that, but you know, the model starts getting accurate after about three months. Okay. Um, yeah. All right, and so, and you guys, it sounds like you guys are using a machine learning based approach, and, and maybe John and Evo for, the bulk of gaming companies, I, I don't think a lot of them are using machine learning based ways of doing predictive LTV at all, right? And so, you know, are they doing a lot of that? I mean, I, I know from my experience, it seems like there's there's a few different approaches that I've seen. And maybe you guys can comment on what you guys are saying. But, you know, one is we talked about a simple, you know, retention ARPDAO model. So you check the ARPDAO, check, check the retention, you know, you draw the retention curve and multiply by the ARPDAO. That's one. Um, I, I think the second way we talked about is, you know, you try and get an ARPU curve and then try to extrapolate that out. That's two. A third methodology is if you've had an existing game before, then um, I don't know what it's called. I call it a factor-based model where you take a bunch of different factors from a similar game and you regress against the LTV or whatever, and then, you know, you, you just kind of weight it that way. But that that's basically all I've seen, and with various levels of sophistications. But generally speaking, I would say the majority of the companies that I've worked with generally use just, you know, ARPDAO retention, and it's very hand wavy. So I don't know. What do you, what, what have you guys seen? Um, I think everyone started with the ARPDAO retention model. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, I don't know anyone who didn't initially start, especially when you're like a new gaming company, like if you. Uh, to Paul's point, if you lack a certain level of sophistication, like you, you have to start somewhere. Right. I, I think directionally, it, it's good to have. Um, however, the limitations to that is like um, how, how it's it's too inflexible, it's too strict, too rigid. Um, you're also baking a lot of assumptions about like the opt out, the user, is it by channel, um, or are you looking at uh, do you have to aggregate that information? And that's why I think it's a lot more directional. The, the second one you talked about, which uh, Paul would describe it as like a 
extrapolating a, a DX row S and then uh, extrapolating an LTV out of it. Um, that's actually where I've seen most companies that have been doing. Um, they would look at their D7 row S and take a multiple and then say, okay, that is our LTV. Right. Okay. Um, also limitations to that. Um, again, very directional. Um, but how do you determine the flexibility of the multiples? Um, how do you differentiate them between geos, channels, platforms, or optimization models? Right. Um, and how often should you update them? So these are big challenges when you're looking at a very rigid way of looking at uh, LTV or determination of recoup. Um, again, directional, but can you make day-to-day -day decision on it? I wouldn't think so. Right. The last one you mentioned is actually what I saw uh, my last six months at Play Studios, our Israeli team was really moving towards a machine learning, taking ingesting uh, user level behavior right. and determining uh, the LTV of those particular users. So some examples of things that they considered is like um, uh, average session time, uh, session depth, uh, number of spins, uh, frequency of payment, amount of payment, and. I, I don't remember, I think there were like, it was kind of insane, it was like 80 different things that they take into account, right. and they trained it over the course of the year, and they did look back to look at the accuracy of it, um, and at the time, I believe, they were like 90% plus in terms of the accuracy of what they predicted uh, after a year, so I know a lot of companies are trying to move in that direction, but do they have the resource to build something like that, and even if you have the resource to build it, should you? Um, and those are all fundamental questions I've seen uh, a lot of companies asking themselves. So you guys answered most of it. <laughs> <laughs> I can add just like a few more yeah. things. It's like most of these models ignore, completely ignore the UA side, which is what the problem is with yeah. these like one size fits all solutions or just like a simple, you know, uh, simple, you know, using a function to figure out what, you know, what the, what the PLTV is. Um, the other thing that's important to mention is that a lot of companies don't really have enough data to actually build machine learning right. models. So that's probably a good question for Paul as well. It's like, you know, which what install volume do you need, and like what what your DU needs to be in order for these models to work well with Algolift. Uh, with Network, we have an we're an SDK SDK solution, so we have like an, our own analytic solution. So we track, you know, users' journey and we understand their behavior and then make predictions based based off of that. Um, which makes it a little easier, and that's why we can do a machine learning model. But the thing is that for a lot of smaller companies, that's not a not really uh, an option, which is why they have to use uh, more uh, simpler models. I mean, okay. Uh, so in terms of sort of the cohort size, so I mean, it really depends on the product conversion rate, but generally, sort of the five hundred uh, installs over a two week cohort is sort of what we need to make projections. Um, the way that we use, so we leverage the RPL TV projection to then inform user acquisition campaigns. So I mentioned so we connect to Facebook, Google, and Apple, and then algorithm will programmatically make changes to those to those campaigns. Yeah. Um, so we're also sort of di directionally is more important is way more important than accuracy. So accuracy is is very key, but also understanding directionally the 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 PLTV across the sort of which channel, which geo, is, is more important than 100% accuracy. So uh, most sort of, uh, well, execs and user acquisition leads want sort of 100% accuracy. If you speak to any sort of data science lead, they will say, you're never going to get there. So, you know, John sort of 90% is, is pretty much where we are in terms of accuracy. And um, the use case of using sort of this data for user acquisition, that's a pretty Pretty decent. Sort yeah, of. you mentioned 500 users. Is, is it users, or is it you know typically when, when you talk to the Facebook machine learning guys, they'll say they need 50 events. So yeah. is, is it the conversion event, or it, as I said, it, so it really de depends on the product for us. Okay. So it, it depends whether it's so we work with games, uh, non, -ga non games as okay. well. So it really depends on the product. There's no sort of rule of thumb of it. it needs to be. Yeah, 50 conversions for us to really Even make Facebook's like, if it's 50 conversions, it's probably done by like 5% of the right. users. Yeah. So that's, you know, like a thousand or whatever. So Nepo had a very good point about yeah. a lot of LTV models not truly taking into account the UA side of things. I want you to, yeah. if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's what Paul pretty much mentioned when he said, like, these things are directional. It's like there is a completely um, another side of like UA which is basically changing on its own. 
and your job when you're using these models is to like optimize things in a way that that yields the highest possible return to the company and not like not it does not return a specific number because it's impossible to guarantee um, it's simply because you know in December UA is more expensive in January it's cheaper uh, every little while there's another homescapes that spends like I don't know 20 million dollars in a month and just completely um, you know uh, changes the market dynamic so you cannot really take these factors into account when building a model which is why your job when building a model is to figure out you know where to spend money in the most efficient way given the current market circumstances mm -hmm. and I think that's why these models have to be directional and not uh, exact if that's the right way to put it yep. um, well directional first and then directional first yeah. yeah and also like uh, my question for you is what is what does the output for like Facebook Google and apps uh, Apple search ads look like especially for Facebook do you you know send more like spend more money on video campaigns or there's like you have a specific output in terms of what the main rise bit should be or like the AO bit should be yeah yeah so um, so I mentioned we do sort of LTV modeling the second piece we do is is optimization of, of, of campaigns so we work across Facebook Google and Apple um, we have uh, algorithms that look at elasticity of CPN CBR and CPI and so we're determining basically if we increase a budget on this uh, VO campaign what does the P ROAS look like as we continue to increase the budget? Mm -hmm. And then taking into account that asset as a part of an overall portfolio across those three platforms, right. what what do we do in terms of increasing the budget on that campaign to like contribute to the, the Right, the so then time. you can come up with uh, profit maximizing exactly. number based on yeah. that. Yeah. So we the way we work with clients is they'll say, look, I want to hit like a say D one eighty payback or maximize D three six five ROAS. So we we don't we rely on the Facebook and Google algorithms to find those um, to find those users through their their own algorithms. So you know whether it's VO or AO or yeah mobile app installs, um, and then we're sort of a layer on top of that to determine uh, sort of which asset type, with the assets being ad sets, campaigns, and keywords, yeah. which asset type should should we buy more or less of? Right. Based on the portfolio P ROAS of, of each of what well, the portfolio and then each of the assets within that portfolio. Right. Um, so yeah, we don't we we tend to ask our clients to sort of have no sort of min ROAS on their campaigns um, and just basically create a campaign and then we will manage at the sort of ad set or campaign level versus sort of trying to to change sort of the app event you know or change the the ROAS. Yeah. Um, so we're basically saying we want more or less of this asset based on its projected ROAS. So that's sort of how we approach the problem. Yeah. And from a customer perspective, are they asking more for this service relative to the PLTV P ROAS stuff, or? So I think it's it's it, the PLTV uh, is you know the PLTV thing is challenging because people have a solution that that works. Uh, and so there's a cost benefit of how much right. do I really want to invest in this? <laughs> yeah. uh, so the application of our PLTV data is much more interesting for clients because automating user acquisition is, is something that execs want, people, you know, UA managers want to save time. Yeah. And most people haven't built UA automation. So right. yeah, they may have bought, built some level of automation, but most people don't have a, a programmatic solution to it. Yeah. Um, so most clients work with us on, on the automation side. Versus just the LTV <laughs> modeling side because they've managed to build an opt out retention model and it, they feel like it work, works enough. Sure. Um, but most people haven't built an, uh, an automation platform yet. And what, what are other things that clients are asking you for? I mean, you see a lot of different you know, needs in the market. What, yep. what are some of the other things that people are asking for? Yeah, I mean, they're, they're sort of, well, the buzzword in, in, in the industry is, is sort of creative. That's sure. sort of yeah. one of the <laughs> only levers that yeah. user acquisition managers have le left. Um, so any insights, so our clients are asking us for insights on creative, uh, that is a real, that's a challenge because it's very hard to sort of, you know, we, we make user level predictions yeah. and so if you have creative reporting at the user level, you, there is the possibility to roll at, at the creative level, right. but it's really hard to sort of make a determination that, you know, you can be serving that creative across multiple different sort of uh, ad sets or campaigns. So just rolling that that creative up on the user level and saying this PLT for this creative, uh, like you can't really you can't really do that. So um, we're you know we're working on insights for clients in terms of the creative level. 
Um, that's sort of the number one asset we've sort of had. Well, the, the other asset we have is, is working on, on sort of non-Facebook, Google and Apple, uh, yeah, yeah, platforms. So um, we're currently integrating with uh, Bungle right now, and we're going to start working with Iron Source uh, soon. Uh, so basically, I think I think the, the sort of the the panacea for, for user acquisition is the automation of all platforms. So right. that's that's really yeah, the vision for for our company. So you're gonna um, put these guys out of work? No, there's always you know like, I think there's a lot of talk. <laughs> <laughs> there's a lot of talk over and like other places. So I mean, there's you know I think it, you know, auto, auto, automation tends to it, it reduces the amount of of people that needs that that need to do the work, but it will never complete, you know, it will never, sure, we still yeah, need, yeah. so the way that we currently work with clients right now, um, and we'd like to automate some items of this, but we still need campaigns created. We don't have a uh, automated way to create campaigns. That's something we'd like to do, but that's quite a hard problem to solve because there's a lot of unknowns around creating campaign and there's, uh, there's a strategic, the strategic element to that that's offline and we don't have historical data on that. Right. Um, and then we need creative refresh, which again, humans are better at sort of really understanding. It's also one of the things that, that one of the problems that it's not really important to solve that much, really. Yeah. And on top of that, Facebook and Google are changing the UIs all the time, so yeah. you would have to play that like catch up game with them all. The, so we, we kind of have the same approach where it's just like, it's not worth it. You have power and carry, you can change things. Yeah, yeah. Well, it's, I, I guess yeah. what, what might be interesting for us to, to build is sort of giving insights on what they might to create versus actually yeah. just creating them. So, yeah. we, you know, like looking at everything in, within right. on that platform yeah. and basically making a recommendation of we think this, if you create this sort of campaign, it, it will start gaining traction. Yeah. This, this created, this right, exactly. targeting, this optimization model, yeah. make more of those. Versus, exactly. I think with yeah. automation, a lot of it is about time saving, right? right? So when you're thinking about, let's say, if you have four campaigns with like 30 line items each, right? Yeah. Um, uh, at least on the uh, DSP side, you either have a person who will go in and make a creative change on every single line item by campaign, or you find a way to do it via an API. Um, it, building that up is an incredible uh, time saver, and then what the UA person will essentially do is that instead of doing this execution kind of ad hoc type work, will shift towards more analysis, right? right. Understanding like, okay, how can I spend my dollar more efficiently? Right. So you guys just become more strategic. A little bit, yeah. So it changes the role of what you do. So um, I would say like, what, five years ago or, or even three years ago, you have these massive, massive UA teams because you needed that amount of people and hands in the, to actually pull all the levers. What we're trying to do is to eliminate the number of like manual lever pulling and automate that so that you can have less teams, less people in the team, but much more efficient. Right. So last question, guys. So what's what's the future in terms of whether it's how we think about PROAS or PLTV uh, and, and sort of you know uh, how we do do away with these types of metrics? Uh, what, what, do you, what do you think? Where, where, where are we going? Or what's the next service that you guys are going to offer? Yeah, well, I think see, I think start with sort of market trends of, of cost of user acquisition rising over time means yeah. that that companies are going to need to get better at predicting LTV and, and they're going to put more resources into doing that because they want the confidence that when they make when they invest marketing spend they're going to get it get it back. Right. So I think I think there's going to be a lot more investment. You know, obviously we're going to do that, but I think uh, inside companies as well. So companies are going to hire more data scientists to, right. to be able to make these predictions and make them. Uh, more accurate and more direct, uh, and directly correct. Um, so that would be the first thing on the LTV side. I think there's going to be investment on that side, driven driven by the, the rising cost of, of user acquisition. And then I think overall automation is going to be a trend in the industry, and there's a lot of buzz around automation. So right. how do how do we sort of cross look, look cross platform to automate user acquisition? Um, what can we do on creative? What can we do on on sort of creating campaigns? I think there's just just a general trend towards more more automation is, is going to be the overall trend. What about you guys? I mean, as the industry continues to like consolidate, there's like uh, fewer players, and they're much bigger. Yeah. I think, uh, as you mentioned, automation is going to be really important. Um, there's probably going to be some commoditization of PLTV, like more people will be able to use solution out of the box solutions such as Autolift or um, you know any other solution, you know. Um, and uh, and it's going to be really important to understand where to invest money across the portfolio, not just games. And you know that's where automation plays a really important role in understanding where and how to spend money. 
Um, uh, yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty much it. You know, it's just like there can be fewer channels, but you'll need to understand better how to spend money at scale. And, um, and I'll, uh, I'll go to Zara Corner for that. Yeah, I agree with uh, you both. I think most of the conversation around like, automation is really about increasing sophistication or what it boils down to is efficiency, right? Time management, how can you do the most work with the least amount of time? Um, and that's the whole idea behind automation. And it's funny because like the word automation has been around for what, what, three years and, and we have truly, uh, I guess up until now, uh, seen any companies make big strides uh, in that front. Um, I'm sure like Network and a few other companies have done quite a bit, like Lyft and Uber. Uh, but most companies have yet uh, to really build that in house. So I think like solutions like Algolift uh, would be very very helpful for like let's say mid-sized companies to really get dip their toes into uh, having a solution that could allow them to make much more efficient decisions. Right. Yeah, actually, one thing that you mentioned, Paul, really struck me, and I, I kind of so my personal opinion would be that uh, the one bit of analysis that I haven't seen enough of, or, and you know, I started doing some of this work before, which was around what you were talking about, elasticity, right? Mm -hmm. So like, you know, before when we would spend, at the certain scale, things just started to degrade a lot. And so what you're calling it elasticity, whether it's against ROAS or you know, CPM or these other metrics, yep. I think that that potentially could be a pretty strong area of focus for somebody in the future. So yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's, that's one of the core for the core sort of concepts of, okay. of our automation <laughs> platform is okay. understanding sort of how much more capital we can put in any right. certain so you, you, you consider that as a driver of the automation? Yeah, completely. Right. I mean, there's two sides of the equation, right? There's the spend side and the LTV side. And so we have an algorithm for LTV, and then yeah. we have algorithms <laughs> to determine how much we should be spending on where. Um, yeah. So investing, we, you know, we're going to be continuing to invest in both those sides to, to basically maximize ROAS. Awesome. All right, well, I think unless there's anything else, I, that'll do it the for you. Thanks, man. Oh, yeah. yeah. Blue bottle. No, it's no. a no. Oh, no. Yeah. Sorry. All right, it's uh, yeah. a local Soma coffee okay. shop. Um, I would have to because I'm British. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's it's not, I got a judge. I got a judge. <laughs> so, Chento uh, roasts their own coffee beans locally, which is I think great. so, yeah. And uh, it's one of my favorites in the city, so thank you. Nice. Well, thank you for having me. Yeah, I didn't yeah. say that from the Yeah, really thanks, for, thanks for coming on. Yeah. Uh, and I guess I always have to mention thank you, Iron Search, for <laughs> offering uh, this wonderful space for us to. to, to film. Yeah, Iron Search has great APIs. Yeah, I'll, I'll put a little Iron Search uh, thing up front. Put like a little watermark on the bottom. Like, like, <laughs> like here, affiliate. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Thank, right. you. Thanks, guys. thank you. Thank you.